Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Hebrews chapter number 10, as we continue our journey through this wonderful, wonderful book that's been so challenging, I promise you challenging to the preparation and challenging to the application as well. Uh, I should have told you last Sunday, uh, kind of a surprise here today, we just finished part number one. And uh, we will start today with part number two. Now, part one was steeped in doctrine. It was a doctrinal expose, if you will, in the scriptures. We looked at the doctrine of salvation. We looked at the doctrine of the cross. We looked at the doctrine of the covenants. We looked at the doctrine of really the superiority of angels and the superiority of Jesus. And we come now to the beginning of part number two in the book where it just simply says, okay, all this stuff is true. It's doctrinally accurate. So that being said that the cross is true, salvation is true, all of this stuff is true, how then shall we live? In other words, it's one thing to believe something to be true, but how is it affecting your everyday life? How is it affecting your walk with God? Are you better as uh, a result of it? Now, the text is very short, and so I'll ask you, if you will, to stand with me, and let's begin reading Hebrews chapter 10 in verse number 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. And then those are the transition verses. Now he begins to lay out one of the more um, powerful passages in all of the book. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Would you join with me as we pray together? and uh, just seek God. Maybe you're standing beside somebody and they have a very special need in their life. Maybe, they, you, maybe you don't even know about that need. Just pray for that person on both sides of you, your right and your left, and just seek the Lord on their behalf. Father, we approach you now, um, thanking you, blessing you, praising you for who you are. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on that cross for us that we might have access to you, the forgiveness of our sins. God, we pray for those folks that are around us this morning. Lord, you and you alone know the very depths and the recesses of their heart. I pray that you would go to that area, Lord, and you would meet and supply every need that they may have. I pray that Jesus would be glorified, honored in everything that is said and done here this morning. As we lift him up, you said you would draw all men unto yourself. And so as we teach your word, may Jesus be exposed. In his name we pray, amen. Thank you. Be seated, please. Now, verse 19, 20, and verse 21 is the transition verses. He's talking here about the atonement. He's talking about uh, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about the blood of Christ. And in the midst of these three verses, he's giving us the benefits, if you will, of the atonement. I want to kind of unfold those, unpack them for just a minute. They all begin with letter A. It won't take but a minute or two before we get into the body of Christ. But I, I do want you to see the atonement. I want you to see the benefits behind it. The first thing I want you to see is that it puts assurance in our hearts. Highlight and underline the word boldness uh, in the scripture, if you will. 
It literally means certainty or complete confidence or accuracy, if you will. You, you know, I'm, I'm fully convinced that people today have lost confidence in so many things in our culture. We've lost confidence in the family traditional values. We've lost confidence in our government. We've lost confidence, really, in the system of things that we have to live in. But there is absolutely one thing that we can genuinely, with bona fide accuracy and assurance, to know is the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and what it did for our salvation and for the forgiveness of our sins. Now, the second thing I want you to see is that it provides access into God's presence. You know, we've hammered this for a number of weeks that the old covenant was very faulty. The only thing that it could do was really expose sin. But it could never, ever get people into the presence of God. And the Bible tells us here that you enter into the holiest by the blood, not of a goat or a calf, but by the blood of Jesus. Once a year, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and he would offer up a blood sacrifice that literally would just roll the sins of the people ahead for another year until he could get back in there. But when Jesus went to the cross for us, he once and for all dealt with our sins, never having to do it ever again. And that immediately opened up access between us and God of which the high priest could never do that. Let me give you number three. The atonement puts immediate acceptance into our hearts. Uh, the Bible tells us that we have been accepted by God through the beloved. Now notice the little phrase that he's using here in the passage. He says, by a new and living way. In other words, by a dedicated way. Uh, I was driving down a secret shortcut the other day and I looked on one of the signs of the street signs that were there and that street was dedicated to a particular person. We oftentimes dedicate things like that to individuals. I'm fully convinced though that dedication is waning. People's life dedication is waning in the kingdom of God today. But the Jews knew exactly what this writer was talking about here. And, and, and they knew it because uh, of a particular holiday that they had celebrated that you and I celebrate as Christmas. Uh, the Jewish nation celebrates Hanukkah. And it, Hanukkah literally means dedication. You know that during the Maccabean revolt, I'll get a little bit, historical with you here for just a minute. Uh, during the Maccabean revolt, there was an old boy but a, a very tyrant, if you will, vile and wicked as he could be, by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. He ransacks the temple. He goes into the Holy of Holies and he desecrates that temple like nothing else he could have ever done when he took a pig and he offered it up on the altar of sacrifice in the Holy of Holies. Now, I mean the new Jewish nation was torn up. I, they were upset about it. And when they came in to undo what was done, they went to the temple and they rectified everything that was desecrated in a matter of eight days. In eight days, they undid everything that Antiochus Epiphanes had done. When they had finished, they fashioned a golden lampstand with eight stems on it, signifying each stem for one day that it took to set the temple and consecrate and rededicate it again. In John chapter number eight, Jesus, in the midst of the Jewish festival of Hanukkah, he pointed out to that lampstand, that eight-stemmed lampstand that goes back to the dedication of the temple. And he stood up and he said, I am the light of the world. You don't need the lights of Hanukkah. You don't need the lights uh, of man-made. I am the light of the world. And I am the one that will open up the access to God through the cross. And then after 20, 
after verse 20, there begins this uh, powerful segment of scripture that starts out with let us. It's the let us in the garden of the Bible. Okay? And he, and he does it in several ways. And that's what I want to point out this morning. The let us of the scripture. Now I want you to see first of all that it is a call to close communion. A call to close communion. Watch this in verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, what the writer is doing here, he's making his first appeal. And he's saying, let us draw near to God. He doesn't say, let God draw near to us because God was already in us. The day that we turn away from sin is the very day uh, and place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is the day that God deposits his Holy Spirit in us and we get all of God that we're ever going to get on that day. But he's saying here to us, God's already near us, so let us draw near to God. Now, I don't know about you, but there is an inertia in me that tends to draw away from the presence of God. Now, you may not be like that. Uh, you, you may not be one of those people that have a tendency. I was on my way to church this morning and I was listening to an old hymn, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. I have that in me. I have that tendency in me to draw away from the sense of the presence of God. We've got the world that draws for our attention away from God. We have the flesh that draws our attention away from God. We've got the devil that draws our attention away from the presence of God. Now, I've got a 20-year-old black convertible BMW. Now, it's a wreck. It looks like a wreck. Back glasses, I've got it glued together where my grandson put his foot through it. And it looks terrible. And it leaks. I can't drive. You can't even sit in it when you're going through the car wash. But the worst thing about it is I get in that car, and that mechanically it's pretty sound. The motor's good, all that stuff. I, I'd, I'd drive to California in it tomorrow. But it's got one fault in it mechanically that drives me nuts. I'll be going down the road about 40, 50 miles an hour, and I put on my brakes, and as soon as I hit the brake, that car wants to go this way. And I just have to fight to keep it on the road. You understand what I'm saying? That's exactly the description of what most of us deal with in our life. We have a tendency to veer off, to be drawn away. And the writer says there, there is a great need in all of us to draw near to the presence of God. Now, how do you do that? How can you draw near? What does that look like? If, if we're in God and God is in us, what does it mean let's draw near to him? Now, and remember, he's talking about a keen awareness of the presence of God in our life. Listen to this statement. I believe with all of my heart, if all of us in this room had a keen awareness of the presence of God, we wouldn't sin near as much as we do. We'd stay more righteous than we really do. Now, there are four things I've listed today just kind of practically help us. The first thing is, uh, I believe if you stay confessed up, I spoke this week to the uh, Be Still Mama on Tuesday morning and, and they put me on the spot afterwards and I had to answer questions that they have. And one young lady asked a very penetrating question. She says, why is it necessary after you confess your sins and receive Jesus and be saved, why is it necessary for us to confess in a daily basis? And I drew attention to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9 that was written to believers. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. The same blood that forgives us of our past sin is the same blood that forgives us of our present sin. And we go before God to confess our sin to him, not to inform him, but to let him know that we know that he knows. You like that? 
You're not making him aware of anything except the fact that you're aware that he's aware. Now, we, we, don't, we don't leave out confession because the fact is we don't want to get immune to sin. We don't want to get used to sinning. Uh, the fact that we sin is an amazing thing that we want to keep being stabbed in our heart. We want to keep getting hurt by the very thing that hurts God so that we can get it right and we can be forgiven. Number two is to seek his face in prayer consistently. Isn't there something in the inertia of who we are that just pulls us away from having a consistent prayer life? I mean, we have all of the good intentions in the world. I was speaking just recently to a group of people and, and this young lady, she just burst out into tears and kept crying and she said, I'm so tired. I've got to fight kids. I've got to work. I've got to do this. And there are all kinds of things that are vying for our attention. We have all of the good intentions in the world of getting up at a certain time of the day and getting started right in prayer. But then we go in and the coffee pot runs over and we got to clean that up. We weren't expecting to have to do all of that. And, and then the phone rings and that's a distraction. And then we get to looking at the laundry list of everything that we have to do during that day. And that is a distraction. And by the end of the day, when we've worked all day and we have no energy left, we can't stay awake long enough to pray. Consistent prayer life. L listen to me just a minute. Um, the older I get, the more that I realize that the only eternal significant thing that I'm ever going to do in my life is going to be born out of prayer. Consistent prayer life. Number three, praise and worship in our private life. We find it pretty easy to come in here, don't we? Uh, congregated up with seven, eight, nine hundred people. We find it pretty easy to just get caught up in the emotions of the things, lift our hands and praise God, give him glory. But what about your prayer, private life? What, what about those times when we could just be alone with the Lord and lifting up our hands unto him and praising him and glorify him and adoring him for who he is and letting him know that we believe with all of our heart that he's God of all gods. Just worship, by the way, can I say something to you? Your corporate worship will never rise above your private worship. If you're not worshiping privately and at home, you're not gonna worship too much in the house of God. Let, let me give you number four. This is gonna surprise some of you, but I just really felt like it needed to be said today. I believe one of the things that helps us to draw near to Christ is the Lord's Supper. I really do. Some of you come in and you see that white tablecloth down here at the front and you think, oh my, not again today. You know, we just had it just two or three months ago. We're going to do it again? Pastor, don't you think five or six times a year is just too much? No. I, I'm telling you, when I'm sitting here and I'm looking into the faces of people while the Lord's Supper is being distributed and I'm watching those tears flow down people's cheeks and I'm watching them get caught up in the very significance of that bread and that juice is that it's the broken body of Christ. It is the shed blood of the Lord Jesus we are reminded of everything that he's ever done for us on that cross and we would be nothing apart from him. I get to thinking about how much of the grace of God he bestowed on me to get me saved. You know what happens? It draws me near God. The Lord's Supper, I believe, was intended for Jesus to be the host and we are the invited guest. All right. Let me move on here. Let me give you number two. You ready? It's a call to consistent commitment. Watch this in verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. 
Now watch that little phrase, profession of our faith. Some of your Bibles, and by the way, I'm really glad that he put that here, but some of your Bibles may also say the hope that we profess. That's powerful. What is that hope? What is he referring to? He's referring to the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And everything that he has promised us as a result of that finished work. He has promised us salvation, forgiveness of sins. He has promised us eternal life. He has promised us abundant life. He has promised us a victorious life. But here's the deal. It's one thing to make a profession, but it's another to live it out in your life. I know a lot of people that are claiming to know Jesus that don't live like it. Their life doesn't support their profession. The Bible says let's hold fast with that hope. Let, let, let me ask you a question this morning. Um, you ever see me talk to people as they walk down the aisle to receive Jesus? You ever seen me do that? I, I ask them some, some very pertinent things. One of the first things I ask them is, did, did you pray that prayer with me as I prayed it this morning? And the tears be flowing, yes, I, I prayed that. Then I ask them, do you really mean it? But the third question I ask them is this. Do you believe that God would ever tell you a lie? Do you believe that he would ever tell you anything that was not true? And they'll say, they have to think about it a minute. They're not only anticipating that question. They'll think about it a minute. And finally, they'll say, no, God would never tell me a lie. Why? Because ladies and gentlemen, God's never gonna go back on his word. You can depend, can I get an amen from anybody in the house? God's never gonna turn his back on his word. Our hope is not in a prayer. Our hope is in him, in what he said that he would do. We need to hold on to him unswaveringly. I, I watch though, and you have to, you see it. I watch so many Christian lives, they're, they're like a roller coaster at Disney. They're high on Jesus one day and then they're down here another. They're up here and down here just this way all in their Christian life roller coasting around in their walk with God. Up and down. May I say to you, you don't have to live like that. You don't have to live like that. God is a God of his word. Now, let me give you number three. It's a call to caring confrontation. Now, as soon as I use that word, uh, people automatically get very defensive because they see that term as being negative. When we get ready to put somebody on staff, one of the things that we do is we give them a personality profile test. And in many types of personalities, we read in the body of the report as it comes back to us is that uh, this person, and they'll name them, uh, this person hates confrontation at all cost. They will avoid confrontation at all cost. But this is not the negative term that the word is being used here. Watch it with me, if you will, in verse 24. And let us consider one another to confront, provoke unto love and to good works. Now he's saying you were to confront each other, not in a judgmental, condescending, negative, put down kind of way, but lovingly and caringly with the end in mind to encourage people to be committed, the Bible says, to do good deeds. We watch people today as they're church shopping, looking around, one church to another, and they're looking for a church that they say can meet my needs. Or what can the church do for me? What can the church do to help me? And you'll ask them a question, where have you been? Where have you been going to church? Uh, why are you leaving that church? And, and they will oftentimes say, well, you know, I'm not going back there because I'm not being fed. Or I'm not being amused. Or they're just not keeping uh, my interest. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I don't mean that people can't be drawn to the Lord in the midst of their crisis. 
I'm not implying that the church ought to be cold and indifferent to people. But if you're born again by the Spirit of God, if the Holy Ghost of God lives his life in you, you don't come to church hoping for what you can get out of church and trying to find a place where your needs are going to be met, but you come to church trying to figure out how can I offer up praise and adoration unto God and how can I encourage other people while I'm there? I spent about two hours this week on a conference call with the uh, leaders of the Southern Baptist Convention and they have said that commitment is at an all-time low among many of the churches. When people are asking What's in it for me? You can go to the bookstore and you can see all kinds of shelves being lined with self-love and, and self-esteem books. Now, I, I don't, y'all, I love myself and I, I hope that you love yourself. You ought to love yourself. You, you can't love other people if you don't love yourself. You ought to do that. But I'm gonna tell you something even greater. We need to learn how to love other people. I heard about an old Persian king centuries ago. He's worth over $100 billion. He had a drop-dead, good-looking, break-your-face, beautiful 23-year-old daughter that every man in the kingdom wanted to marry. And the, and the king said, well, it's time for you to get married. And so they kind of summoned every interested and available and qualified male to come and participate in a contest. Now outside uh, the big kingdom building that he lived in, the temple area there, he had a series of pools. One of them was about 50 feet wide and 100 feet long. And uh, all these men now had gathered around that pool and the old king said, now that pool's filled with alligators, saturated with alligators. But to the young man that can dive into that pool and swim to the other side and get out on the other side, to him will I give my beautiful daughter and one half of my kingdom. So they had ready, set, go, and all of a sudden this young guy, he plunges into the water, and I mean he's flying to that other side. He, one alligator just barely missed his ankle. Another one uh, took a hunk out of his arm. Another one kind of bit him on the ear. And he's dodging these alligators as he's swimming as fast and as hard as he can. He reaches the other side and gets up on the other side of the pool. And the king says, well done, young man. You can marry my daughter and you can have half of my kingdom. And the young man said, well, that's all well and good, Mr. King. But the first thing I want to know is who pushed me into that pool? <laughs> that, 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 that's kind of the way that it is with the level of commitment among people in our culture today. I want to ask you to kind of do a little self-evaluation here for a minute. When people look at your commitment, when people look at your dedication, when they look at your consecration, are you spurring other people along or are you dragging people behind? Is their level of commitment raised or lowered as a result of observing what commitment you possess? Number four, and I'll close with this one. It's a call to congregational community. Watch verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. It's amazing what is going on in our culture today. And, and, and I know that I'm speaking to the choir. I, I realize that here this morning. But there is a phenomenon that's occurring today that would have nobody would have even thought of when I was growing up. When I was growing up, every Christian uh, found themselves in the house of God on a Sunday morning. They wouldn't dare miss a Sunday morning service. They wouldn't dare miss a Sunday night service. They were back again on Wednesday night in a Wednesday night service. Church was kind of the central part of the family ties uh, as I was uh, growing up. But nowadays, there are many who feel like if they go to church once a month, 
they've done God a favor. There's a, an aloofness in the spirit of people today that are pulling people away. I, I believe, now, don't, don't be ill with me, but I believe it's a serious biblical issue. When, when you study the word of God and you look at the early church, the Bible says that they were baptized and they joined the local church and they were serving and committed into that body of Christ. I believe we need to get back to that mindset. I've had people literally tell me, well, preacher, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Well, you can be a husband and not show up at the house but about once a month either. You'd be a pretty lousy husband in my estimation. The Bible says here that we are to encourage each other. May I ask you the question this morning, are you doing that? Are you a Barnabas personality? Are you an encouragement to other people, other believers? We have a whole staff of volunteers week after week after week. They're down on the floor in the children's wing down there and they're crawling around on the floor with those babies. And they're not just babysitting, they're talking to them about Jesus. They're teaching them about Jesus. And, and they clean diapers and they wipe snotty noses and they, they, they're there week after week. And I've often thought maybe some of these Sunday mornings what we literally need to do is just dismiss the service and every one of us go down to that nursery area where those babies are being kept and put our arms around those people and say, thank you for being so dedicated and so consecrated. Thank you for taking care of the little babies in this church. We all need that though, don't we? We all need that encouragement. But notice what the encouragement is for. And even more so, as you see the day approaching. What day is he talking about? I personally believe that he's talking about the rapture of the church. I believe Jesus is coming. And I believe it's going to be soon. I used to lead an old invitational hymn that I think would be so appropriate even for today. The words, take my life, and let it be. Do you remember what the last part of that is? Consecrated, Lord, to thee. Dedicated, Lord, to thee. Committed, Lord, to thee. I wonder today, this morning, are you as committed as you need to be? The level of your commitment before Christ, does it please him? Do you come to the house of God looking for an opportunity to worship and to praise and to give glory unto God? And while you're there, do you look for those opportunities to really encourage somebody else in Christ? What about during the week? When people are looking at your life, is their standards raised or lowered as a result of watching you? Would you stand with me and let's pray together. Father, thank you for the privilege today that we have to just dig into your word for a minute. Thank you for the joy and the opportunity to hear from you. Thank you, Lord, that you inspired this writer, uh, Lord, with your Holy Spirit to write it down so, Lord, that we could be drawn closer to you than ever before. I pray that our prayer life, our witnessing, our giving, our church attendance would honor you in every way. Lord, we lift up Jesus praying Lord if there's somebody here this morning that does not know him that today they might turn away from sin repent and receive you into their heart and into their life Lord there's some folks that are here that their membership is someplace else but God you've inspired them this morning to let First Baptist be that place of service and worship for them. And Lord, I just pray we'd receive them this morning. 
For those that need to be saved, save them. For those that need to join, I pray that they will. For those that need to come and just find a place to pray around this altar, God, and just pour their heart out to you and recommit themselves afresh and anew to some area of their life that you've already identified to them personally. God, I pray that they'll be faithful to do that as you are faithful to us. In Jesus' name I pray and for his sake. Amen. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.